this team and others, uh, they were involved in, in designing an instrument that we would want to use for the coming years, in the next 20 years or whatever, um, and that would be built from these building blocks. And it it was successful, it works, and uh, this is the, the one and only light sheet microscope that we now use in the lab. Hello guys and welcome back to the Neuroscience and Beyond podcast. Merry Christmas to everyone. I wish you and your families health, love and peace. Around this time of the year, a lot of people tend to reflect on their previous experiences. I'd like to take this opportunity as well to express my deepest gratitude to all people involved in this podcast. I'd like to start by thanking Christina, Sabina and Lenny, who have put a lot of effort into creating valuable content. The next thanks goes to the program committee of the International Max Planck Research School for Neurosciences, as well as the Cluster of Excellence Multiscale Bioimaging in Göttingen for their generous funding needed for all our equipment, without which our podcast would have not been possible. Huge thanks to the German Primate Center for providing us with a spot where we can shoot our podcast. And last but not least, Thanks to all our guests who agreed to share their story with us. And of course, thank you, dear listeners, for your support. In today's episode, we're going to dive into the fascinating world of light sheet microscopy. We're honored to have Professor Jan Husken, one of the masterminds behind this groundbreaking technology. Prepare to hear about the inspiration behind this remarkable invention and to learn how it allows us to explore biological processes such as the development of a whole organism. Professor Huskin will generously share with us the advantages and limitations of this technique by touching upon interesting topics such as artificial intelligence in microscopy and the meaning behind the term smart microscopy. And now, please enjoy the talk with Professor Jan Huskin. Professor Husken, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So traditionally, we start by asking what motivated you to get into science? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm a physicist by training. Um, I got interested in all sorts of visual things, optics, lasers, astronomy, photography, those kind of things. And uh, that probably inspired me also to become a physicist uh, in school. Math and physics was always the easiest for me, so <laughs> I think it was logical to continue along that path. Um, and yeah, that's how I ended up here in the end. So in your career, throughout your career, you were in, in Europe, also in America and USA. Could you please tell us a little bit more about your academic path? So mm -hmm. when did you do your PhD and postdocs? Sure. Yeah, so as I said, I, I was trained as a physicist. I started in Göttingen um, and then moved to Heidelberg, where I did my diploma in physics. And uh, as I said, I was mostly interested in, in optics and laser physics and uh, somehow uh, got attracted more to astronomy initially, but then found that it's... Uh, you know, that I found it less attractive to have a large setup that I share with other people. I rather have to like to have my own little setup. And for some reason, I, I actually was uh, visiting someone at the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg, which is next door to the EMBL in Heidelberg, a European Molecular Biology Lab. And I happened to go there for lunch and Accidentally, somebody sat next to me who then uh, turned out to be Ernst Stelzer, where I did my diploma and also my PhD work. So it was just a, a combination of, uh, you know, uh, things that typically you don't really plan. And I honestly, I had never really considered moving into biology. So that turned out to be, I think, a smart move because the microscopy that we then developed, so I started with optical trapping and then fluorescence microscopy. And um, I was really inspired by the idea of developing tools for the biology, something that people would appreciate, something that they could really use. Um, and 
yeah, I then decided once sort of this whole light sheet microscopy became really a thing, and uh, that was mainly my PhD work. I then decided to move to a large zebrafish biology lab in San Francisco to do my postdoc, which was Didier Stanny's lab. And um, I spent about four years in the US then before becoming a group leader at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, uh, where I was another six years before moving again to the US to become a, a PI and director of medical engineering at the Morgridge Institute for Research in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, where I was for um, uh, six years and then um, moved back to to Germany, to Göttingen, um, and became a professor here at the university. This back and forward moving, how do you feel? It's, it's in our profession, it's very common to travel yeah. around. and it's, Isn't it exhausting? Or? Oh, it is, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, on the one hand, I'd say it's, it's a nice thing in science that you can you have the freedom to to move around and visit different countries and and work in different places and uh, you know you can choose between a university or a private research institute and different cities different sizes of institutes and research fields so that's of course very exciting uh, I find it mostly challenging when you're actually a research group leader or a professor and you have a team of 10, 15, 20 people sometimes, and suddenly you tell them, oh, by the way, I'm moving. <laughs> Who wants to join me? Um, because suddenly it's not just about you and your family, <clears throat> but it's about moving an entire lab. Um, and that's, of course, challenging with all the equipment mm -hmm. and the science itself, etc. But suddenly you are interfering almost <laughs> with, uh, with the career of 10 to 20 people and their families. Mm -hmm. And that I find the most difficult, you know, that suddenly you're, you're taking away jobs <laughs> from people and asking them to move to a new place, right? Which may be very yeah, difficult. It definitely, it, it, is, it is challenging to um, somehow convey this, hey guys, we, we want to start doing something, but it has to be somewhere else. Yeah. And then... Yeah who's going to join and then maybe build it from scratch, you know, a new team. But um, speaking of astronomy and microscopy, they are, they're pretty common, right? Uh, and um, it's very nice that you did this transition from the big scale to the micro scale. Mm -hmm. However, I wanted to ask you, you already uh, give us a hint that um, the one, one of the reasons that you wanted to um, go to biology is to help biologists with some tools. But is there another reason to, to enter life sciences? Because you are the third, I think, physicist on our podcast who mm -hmm. turned out to work more or less on, in life science. Yeah, I think there's a multitude of reasons why physicists are more and more attracted to work in biology. I mean, on the one hand, it's sort of the, the technological side that physicists like to build instruments and they some of these can be useful in biology and that's also what we do quite a bit. But there's more to that. I think there's also, of course, that you know biological processes also rely on physical principles where physicists are needed to help with uh, you know explaining the biophysics and doing the modeling or those kind of things. Um, but just in general, I'm, I find it really inspiring to work at this interface because there's so much that the physicists can ch contribute to biology by simply asking naive questions, right? So when you put physicists and biologists into one room, which is like my lab meeting, <laughs> um, and the biologist explains something, uh, the physicist would interrupt and say like, wait a second, uh, why do you do it this way? Why don't you do it that way? Or has has really nobody ever studied this? And then the biologist would say like, oh, yeah, this, huh, never thought about it this way. This is interesting, never came up in, mm -hmm. in the group of the biologists. So oftentimes the physicists just with their different mindset have a different view on things and, and ask different questions and suggest different methods. And uh, yeah, I think that really is something that drives us forward, this this multidisciplinary lab environment where, you know, the biologist uh, would maybe 
they, they may not know how to continue. They, they come to an end where maybe the technology doesn't really deliver what they are looking for. And the physicists then jump in and say, oh, I, I can build you something or I can, I can program something for you that allows you to do this. And on the other hand, of course, the biologists give enough input for the physicists so that they can develop something meaningful, right? That it's not just a bunch of microscopists sitting in their basement and developing crazy microscopes that in the end maybe nobody needs. Mm -hmm. It's like a think tank. So science today is very, very complex and we benefit, we can only benefit from different perspectives, right? Yeah. And I, I like this this kind of approach. And when you add up to the physicists and biologists, computational people and also data scientists, then you have a very, very nice team and yeah. you can really achieve a lot of success. But it's, of course, challenging to, I mean, I always find this very challenging to have a critical mass of people in the lab that because it's so broad and ideally you would want to cover so many topics, right, from uh, from the biology all the way to the to the image analysis, it, that crosses you know five six disciplines. You need ideally a chemist for the labeling, a mm. biologist for the for the for the samples, and the the actual biological question. Then the physicist has to build, you know, design the microscope, an engineer builds it. You need machine shop, etc., to a CAT design to to make these systems, and then a computer scientist to program the microscope, a data analyst and data visualization expert to analyze the data. So you cannot have you know six, seven PhD students and six and seven, <laughs> seven postdocs in the lab to just cover the full range, which ideally we would want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's very important. Uh, that you're in in a multidisciplinary environment where the things that you cannot do by yourself in your own lab, at least there's other labs around you that can then jump in and, and mm -hmm. assist you. you know. How do you... So you set all of these different domains which are incredibly complex and hard, but you as a leader, you need to have knowledge in all of these domains. How, how do you keep up with all the advancements? <laughs> this is very striking to me always when I talk to people on yeah. such level. <laughs> yeah, I think in the end, what, you know, in, in my role, it's maybe a little bit different than if it was a lab that's focused entirely on one protein or one pathway or one organ or so. Uh, because of the broad expertise that we need in the lab, I see myself more as a as a conductor of an orchestra, so to speak. Right? I don't. I, don't, I need to know everything a little bit, but I don't need to be able to play all instruments in the orchestra mm. by myself. I have other people who can do it very mm. well. But of course, what that means is that um, I need people in the lab that have a high level of expertise in those different areas, right? So ideally, um, you know, senior postdocs or staff scientists that represent, you know, some of the pillars that our research is built on so that it's not just all on my shoulders, but mm -hmm. I have experts in the lab that I can trust and that can also do some of the mentoring and teaching, mm -hmm. you know, for PhD students, master, bachelor students, etc. So, so to all other complex skills, you have teaching, you have mentoring, you have management, which is incredible. I really admire people like you. Um, throughout your career, you said that you've been to the U.S. several times. Would you maybe uh, make some comparison between the culture of like how people work, motivation in the U.S. and here in mm -hmm. Europe, for example? Well, it's always difficult drawing comparisons because it may sound that one is better than the other in some respects, and, and I would want to avoid that in, in some sense. For me, it, it's just been incredibly helpful to, to have seen many different places. And I think even if you compare you know, a, a, a German university with the EMBL uh, or a Max Planck Institute with, with universities, there, there's already a big difference. Um, and of course, if you go into a different country like the US, there may be other differences as well. And I wouldn't say one is better than the other. It's just important 
um, or at least it was very important for me to have seen all the different places and the different cultures. And I feel like in my lab, I've carried some of that along with me into my lab and used a lot of the things that I've learned from my mentors, things that I've seen in different places. Um, I think in the US, a lot is more focused on the individual people. Um, of course, there's still, you know, consortia and collaborations, etc. But it's more focused on the career of individual people. Right? Mm -hmm. People are very proud if they achieve something, uh, and and you know, and and also if somebody achieves something in their lab, they are very proud that somebody won a poster prize. Or and it and it's more. I always feel more focused on the individual mm -hmm. achievements mm -hmm. rather than saying our lab achieved mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Um, and in our case, anyway, it's very important that everybody collaborates with almost everybody else in the lab, and it's not an achievement on, of an individual person. Uh, work hours can be very different. You know, in the U.S., you have fewer fewer vacation days, and um, and people tend to work longer and more. <clears throat> also, maybe more on the weekends. But you find the same in in some top research mm -hmm. institutes in in Germany as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in any case, it is very helpful and useful for everybody to have experience all around the world and it can only be beneficial. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be the US. Yes. I think yes. you know, in the past, people like to say, oh, you have to do a postdoc in the US. I, I don't think that's the case anymore. There's mm -hmm. many other good places also in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we might be a little bit spoiled because Germany is already a very good place to do science. So their incentive to go somewhere else may be lower, but still you learn a lot by, by moving abroad and seeing other places. Yeah, regarding the spoil aspect, I totally agree <laughs> because I'm a foreigner and I came here and I, I basically was overwhelmed and happy and, I don't know, grateful that I could play around with instruments that are millions of euros and have access to library equipment people labs everything is basically set up you just need to sit a little bit learn and work and the chance that you achieve success is very high yeah. and it's, it's and of course if <clears throat> i mean one thing i forgot maybe was that you know in germany education is more or less free mm -hmm. right <clears throat> whereas in the u.s The students or their parents have paid a lot of money, and uh, that, of course, puts a lot more pressure on the students, I'd say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's always beneficial, but um, there's a different drive sometimes in these students because they they are very honored to be uh, accepted to that particular university, and that creates a very different spirit, both in a good and in a bad way. So. Mm -hmm. I think it's 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 better to have it f have education you know for free or almost for free like in like here, um, but it's something you have to keep in mind right mm -hmm, when you mm -hmm. work with students there that they've paid a lot of money <clears throat> and they are incredibly um, honored to be part of that campus mm -hmm. um, and that's something that yeah comes out in their work as well mm -hmm. to put this in perspective in in germany for example in a state university the yearly fee is roughly six seven hundred euros and in the u.s it's maybe in a range of ten thousand twenty thousand even more oh, easily more more, more? Yeah. okay <clears throat> that, that's, yeah. that's that's just <laughs> way 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 yeah. more yeah. yeah so after your wonderful journey you eventually wanted to come back to göttingen Is there a reason besides that you were born here? or um, <clears throat> I, I definitely wanted to return to Germany. Um, I think we, my family and, and me really enjoyed being in the U.S. And Madison is a, is a, is a one, has been a wonderful city for us. Um, I think it was mostly with the pandemic also that we really felt the urge to come back to Europe, um, specifically to Germany, that it... That Göttingen worked out was uh, a bit uh, coincidence, um, which we are very happy about because Göttingen is our hometown for both my wife and me. Uh, so we are very pleased to be back here. But of course, Göttingen is also a fantastic university town and has fantastic science to offer. And especially the, the excellence cluster, uh, multi-scale biological imaging is something that is very close to my heart. And so... <laughs> was just a perfect fit and I'm very grateful for the Humboldt Foundation that uh, this professorship worked out that allowed me to come here. 
That's great. I mean, the city can only benefit from scientists like you, so it's a win-win situation, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, and microscopy has always been very strong in Göttingen. Mm -hmm. Although I must say, you know, it's been more focused on the nanoscopy, the high resolution microscopy, whereas what we do is more the mesoscale imaging, uh, whole embryo imaging, uh, which hasn't really been uh, covered so well here. So I think we are filling a niche that was simply uh, present here in Göttingen. It's a perfect fit. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Now we have experts in a different scale, which is incredible. Yeah. I think this is a great point to start talking about science um, after uh, having the chance to get to know you a little bit more. Can you please tell us what is the focus of your research? I know that your lab, as you already also mentioned, uh, it's very multidisciplinary. What do you do in your research? Yeah, so if I had to summarize it in one sentence, it's basically we try to describe and understand biological phenomena and development as well in organogenesis and uh, organ function by using advanced light microscopy techniques. So the physicists in the lab try to build instruments that allow the biologists to do experiments that they could otherwise never do. That would simply be impossible with commercial instruments. And sometimes it's just little things um, that may be trivial where you just need a 3D printer Uh, to build a component that simply wouldn't be available on a commercial system or a piece of code that allows you to run an experiment in a way that you could never do. Um, but as it has been in many fields, uh, imaging or technology as such has been very much a key to success oftentimes to dis for discoveries. And so uh, we have been the first to describe some developmental processes in zebrafish mostly, so in vertebrate development, uh, or also in the heart of the zebrafish. We were the first to acquire multidimensional fast volumetric uh, images in multicolor in a living embryo uh, and reconstructing the heart with all its details, which yeah simply was impossible with existing microscopy techniques. So... I think there has been a lot of uh, many different topics that we've tried to address in biology. The focus has always been on, you know, the things that happen at the interface and being able to do um, microscopy development at the interface of biology, meaning that everything we develop has, has a meaning um, and it's not to simply push the limits of physics. Right? It's not been our goal to, you know, at any cost improve the resolution, for example, because we know on that way you're making some sacrifice. Mm -hmm. The phototoxicity, so the damage you induce in the sample may be higher, uh, and that's something that we always try to avoid. Right? So having this, this, this combination is vital in many ways, that the biology we do is not uh, an artifact of the microscopy. Um, and at the same time, um, the microscopy um, is, is moving in the right direction and not, not drifting off into something that is of purely technical advancement and of no benefit for the life sciences. Mm -hmm. I, I very much like this because um, nowadays I read a lot of papers With using these very fancy techniques and methods, but in the end, the information, the knowledge that we gain out of it is not that spectacular. You could address this question with um, very simple techniques. And I like that um, you also focus not only on the development of the tools, but also on answering real biological questions, which is to my, as a biologist, for me, this is more important, right? Yeah, and especially the, I think, answering the bio, uh, a specific biological question is rarely done by an individual lab, right? Mm -hmm. It's always, so most of the time, a collaborative effort, right? One lab finds some evidence, some other lab finds some other evidence, and then over the years, sort of the whole puzzle comes together, and suddenly people are able to understand a disease or developmental process or so. So I think it would be foolish to think that we built a fancy microscope, we do some research in the lab, and we are able to answer a fundamental huge question. So if 
our I think our our mission should be that the instruments that we build that we also make those accessible to other scientists, mm -hmm. right? Because we cannot, with, with a handful of biologists I have in my lab, which is just half of the lab essentially, um, we will never get to the ultimate goal of answering some some big questions. So we have to be able to share the instruments with others. And I totally see what you just said, that oftentimes in microscopy, people build fancy instruments, they publish in a nature methods or something, and then the biologists read the paper and say, ah, I wish I had such a microscope, but at that moment, there's only one in the world. Mm -hmm. It's in the lab where the people have developed it. And either you have the skills to build a copy of that yourself, which only very few people have, or you are at an institute where you have people who will build it for you, uh, or you wait many years sometimes Uh, for a commercial system to become mm -hmm. available. But then it's likely half to one million euros and you may simply not be able to afford it. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so our goal is that whatever we develop, we actually have the possibility to, to teach other people how to copy such a device or ideally multiply it, build several of these and then send them to other people. <laughs> We're going to go back to this topic um, because it is very, very exciting. But before we go there, let's start with, with the basics. So you're one of the co-inventors of the light sheet of microscopy. Mm -hmm. Already we talked about um, microscopy several times on our, our podcast, um, but we were dealing with super resolution going in depth in, in, in a small scale in nanometer nanometers range, also electron microscopy. But you are doing something completely different. You, as you already uh, mentioned, it's about the different scale of organism. Could you please briefly, I mean, this is exciting for me personally to hear about the story behind the invention of this mm. microscope and then What is the, the, the goal of it and why is it better to use it for, for this purpose than other microscopes? Yeah. So during my diploma work, I mostly worked with optical tweezers, optical levitation. So the idea of using optical forces. This is very complex already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we'll come to the microscopy, but it's, it's, it's basically the idea to use laser beams to trap small particles and uh, confine them or in levitation to use optical forces to push particles in liquid along a certain path. And if you use multiple beams, you can confine something, you can rotate it with some tricks and you can move it uh, around. And my initial task in my PhD project was uh, in the context of a multi-lens microscope where we had four objective lenses and a tetrahedron to use these laser forces to move an object around And it did work to some extent, but the microscope was very complex and, and very difficult to use. And it was very difficult to also put the sample into the microscope, which I, I didn't really like. And in that context, it became interesting to study the question, what information can you gain if you have multiple objective lenses and you can look at an object from different sides? And it became very quickly apparent that, of course, as soon as the object is larger than your penetration depth, like how deep you can look into the specimen, having multiple views allows you to reconstruct the sample in a much better quality. And at that time, we just wanted to use four fixed objective lenses. But then the idea was born to build a separate setup, small setup, where you could simply rotate the specimen and look at it from different sides. And if you had a fluorescently labeled sample and you would just illuminate it broadly, uh, then what you're missing is this optical sectioning, the ability to look at individual planes in the specimen. And for some reason then this idea was born to use a slit or a cylindrical lens to confine the excitation light to a narrow sheet and put the object into this sheet so that you see only one plane. And again, the, the main idea was this, what is now known as multi-view fusion, where you have multiple views that you fuse to reconstruct an object. But with this light sheet idea, it became quickly apparent that 
uh, it allowed us to give a lot of these image features that you uh, typically know from confocal microscopy or two-photon microscopy, which is namely optical sectioning and the ability to acquire a three-dimensional image of the object. And then it turned out that this is incredibly fast using a camera rather than doing the point scanning like you do in a confocal. And then having the ability to rotate the specimen was yet another benefit because of the speed we had the time to rotate the specimen and image it from different sides. And yeah, that's basically how the light sheet microscope then was born. It's not an idea that was brand new. It's something that people had done, you know, a hundred years ago, but not in life sciences and only um, in like colloidal sciences to, to visualize uh, particles in a liquid or particles in a crystal or a glass. Um, and so this was the first time this was really applied uh, to live specimens. It, it's very fascinating, this kind of serendipity to take something from somewhere else and apply yeah. it in, in, in different um, um, yeah, field. And it, it works amazingly well. And it's just incredible. And know? it's important to understand. I, I think that's when, when people ask about, oh, how did this in invention happen? Uh, I think there's a lot of great inventions every day. <laughs> it's just that sometimes they are too early or too late, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think the we were fortunate that when this mi microscope idea was born and implemented, it was exactly at the same time where fluorescent proteins became available. Mm -hmm. So people had the ability to generate transgenic animals where one or the other organ would be you know, fluorescent in green or red, uh, which is critical because light sheet is a fluorescence imaging technique. And if you have transgenic animals, then then the, the instrument will actually shine. And the third aspect was that people got more and more interested in imaging whole organisms. Mm -hmm. You know, cell biology was, was very, very strong also at the, on those days. And at EMBL, everything was on in cells. <laughs> cells on cover slips pretty mm -hmm. much, mm -hmm. right? And... Um, and it became apparent that while you can collect uh, very interesting and meaningful information from a thin cell on a cover slip, it, it doesn't really represent how our cells grow in our body. <laughs> and, uh, and people were more excited about the idea of imaging whole embryos, whether it's fly embryos or C. elegans worms or zebrafish, that was the thing. And so together with a transgenesis, as well as the light sheet microscope, that was the thing that was really that. There were three things coming together at the right time, in the right place, and and that was part of the success. I'd say it's yeah. it's very 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 nice for our community, and very thankful that I live in this time to experience and have a, an option to play with instruments like this. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the next discoveries, but maybe we can briefly talk about it later. So. Now you have this very nice invention, a new microscope. What kind of biological questions do you address in your lab? Mm -hmm. So there's essentially two main advantages of light sheet microscopy. One is the speed. I already mentioned mm -hmm. that using a camera, a fast, sensitive camera allows you to take a, an image very quickly anywhere in the object, basically, as long as it is relatively transparent. The second thing is that because you're illuminating the sample only in one plane, that is the only plane that's exposed to the light and that is potentially harmed by the light. So that could be photo bleaching, so your fluorophores disappear after some time, but it could also be heating or photo damage in the tissue. So that's very much minimized compared to confocal or two photon microscopy. So with those two advantages in hand, what it means is that you can look at very fast phenomena something like calcium activity or membrane potentials in excitable cells in brains or hearts. Uh, you can look at uh, fast moving objects like the heart or blood cells in the heart or in the vascular system. And the low phototoxicity allows you to image something for an extended period of time. So you're not just imaging something for a few hours, but you're suddenly able to image something for a few days, which was completely unheard of <laughs> in the days of you know, where there were only confocal microscopes. So, of course, in the early days, we used those two advantages as much as we could. So um, 
One thing we've done quite a bit is uh, looking at zebrafish development, gas relation, trying to track every single cell ideally in the process of the early development of the vertebrate fish. Um, and then the second was uh, imaging the heart. So, so far, uh, especially when I then do joined Didier Stenier's lab, which is a cardiovascular expert in the zebrafish, it turned out that most people had looked at fixed hearts. And of course, looking at a fixed heart is, <laughs> is not ideal because you're missing entirely the dynamics of the, of the development as well as on the function of the heart. And so my goal during my postdoc was then to um, build a dedicated light sheet microscope with which we could image the beating heart in 3D. And since then, it's something that we've done in the lab and perfected by now with dedicated instruments, as well as the, the software to reconstruct the beating heart. Um, we are now also getting a little bit more into neuroscience using light sheet for imaging uh, calcium activity in zebrafish brains, um, something that's extensively already been done. But with our new flamingo microscope and uh, some new light sheet ideas, especially paired with smart microscopy, so some of the uh, imaging informatics that go along with LightSheet, we have the ability to now look at these from a slightly different angle than, than mm. people have done so far. A lot of interesting things. I would like to just clarify some of the terms like the phototoxicity or damage, mm -hmm. or you already briefly touched upon, but for the people who do not have experience with microscopy, there is always this trade-off because we label our samples either genetically, and there are proteins that fluoresce upon light mm -hmm. or we add some dyes or antibodies which are also fluorescently conjugated and again we use light to basically um, detect the the targets that we want to study and there is always this trade-off of how strong is your laser how much signal do you get but then how much damage do you induce to the tissue and this is one of the great um advancement uh, i mean um, um benefit of light sheet that it can be not that toxic for, for mm -hmm. the cell. And this allows you, as you already said, very nicely to image over a huge uh, time span, which you cannot do with uh, this other laser microscopy, let's say light laser microscopy, right? Mm -hmm. And the smart microscopy in flamingos, we are slowly going there. But let me ask you, why do you use zebrafish, right? We want to understand something about the biology of humans, but yeah. you use fish. Why yeah. is this so, <laughs> right? Yeah, so um, there are a few established model organisms in biology, and they range from, you know, simple cells in culture, yeast, to simple worms like C. elegans, all the way to mouse and rats and pigs and monkeys that are being used um, in animal experiments to to understand things that that relate also to human health. Um, the zebrafish is ideal in, in, in various uh, terms. One is that it's a vertebrate, so it's it's a bit closer to us humans than um, than than a fruit fly is. Um, it's relatively translucent, so you know it's the favorite pet of the microscopist. I'd say that uh, it's easier to look into. A, a developing uh, zebrafish embryo than it is uh, to look into a, even a developing fly. Um, and of course, a developing mouse embryo is almost impossible to see because it's in the womb of the mother. And so in the zebrafish, the embryos develop externally. So the fish lay the eggs, fertilized, and then you can watch them develop in a Petri dish. And um, <clears throat> what we always like to say is that we try to build the microscope around the sample. So in case of a zebrafish, you know, you, you have the egg in a drop of water and you can watch it develop. And we just have to be gentle with our objective lenses and our laser light to not disturb this development. Um, it's initially protected by a chorion. So inside this eggshell uh, for the first two days or so, the embryo develops very happily. And you can simply put the egg in a microscope in its eggshell, which is also translucent, and watch the development. Later on, you have to remove the chorion, 
And then uh, you, we put the fish typically in, in, in plastic tubes where they have the space to grow. And then we can go up to like five days or so of development, essentially from, from, the, from the first cell division all the way to a, a fully functioning larvae, which is five days old. We can, we can watch this process happen live in the microscope, right? And that's, there's simply no no other good organism where you can really do this with significant relevance also for human health. So the heart has a lot of similarities. I mean, it's only two chambers, but it beats at about the same rate as the human heart. And there's uh, a lot of mutants and tools available that allow us to mimic cardiac diseases that you see in humans. And also uh, during my, my postdoc, we worked on optogenetics where we were, had the ability to use lasers to change the heart rate, to even stop the heart or to, to induce certain arrhythmia in the heart. So all of that is very close to humans, but it's still a long way and uh, you know we cannot skip over the mouse, but things that we can watch live in the zebrafish could be hints of what other people could then maybe uh, learn from that and study in the mouse and then carry it all the way to humans. <laughs> yeah, optogenetics is another fancy technique where people use some um, biology. So basically they transgenetically modify some proteins that are then modifiable or switchable turned on and off via light and then when we study excitable cells such as cardiomyocytes the cells in the heart or the cells in the brain neurons then we can activate them or switch them off and it's mm -hmm. it's very interesting opportunity to um, manipulate your sample with this technique and then image it at the same time and acquire the information when you um, say we image it, uh, the samples, what is the scale? What kind of um, millimeter, micrometer range can you go into yeah. the sample? So the zebrafish, as I said, is relatively translucent. So early on, um, the embryo is, is a bit smaller than about a millimeter. And then uh, over the development, when it's a larva, it's several millimeters in size. And uh, ideally, of course, what you would want to achieve is submicron resolution, so subcellular resolution, but you would want to try to achieve it across several millimeters, right? And that's sort of this multi-scale challenge, right? Mm -hmm. That you want to be able to see tiny little things, um, ideally simultaneously, even though they might be millimeters apart. And that's something that's very difficult to achieve, right? And light sheet is probably the best technique for doing this because it is so fast, as I already described you. It allows you to rotate the sample. We can also do tiling, so you're acquiring different parts of the sample and then you, you stitch those images together to get a whole picture of the entire sample. And in, in, in terms of depth penetration, we are not quite there that we can go halfway in. As I said, that would be required because we always have the view from the back to mm -hmm. get the backside. Um, so sometimes you just can't look deep inside. Sometimes you only see the surface and a little bit, a few hundred microns into the sample, but still it's good enough to observe the basic phenomena that people typically are interested in. Mm -hmm. What about samples, for example, um, that are not transparent like zebrafish? Um, we know that there are several methods where you can get a mouse brain and then somehow clear it mm -hmm. and look at it. How is this working? Yeah, so of course it's something we do as well, um, especially in our attempt to extract as much information as possible from a given sample. So typically what's currently done is that people say, I want to do live imaging. So they take a sample, they put it in the microscope, they image it as fast as they can, as deep as they can go for as long as they want or as they can go. And then at the end of the experiment, they, they discard the sample, right? The uh, zebrafish embryo um, would be either put back into the fish tank or maybe, you know, it, ideally it has survived the experiment. If not, it would have to be uh, killed and discarded. Um, but... 
That's not the way it should be done. Ideally, at the very last time point, when your movie ends, you still would want to extract as much information as you can. And so at that moment, you could do whatever you want to the sample once it's fixed, right? And what people have done in the past was simply slicing it. <clears throat> so you can take a fixed sample, put it in a vibratome, <clears throat> excuse me, in a vibratome, and then cut it into salami slices mm -hmm. and look at it, um, these individual slices. But it becomes very difficult to register these slices and reconstruct the, the whole object again. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's destructive. Once you've destroyed it, it's gone. Right? So it's actually an old technique which has been used in, in pathology and anatomy to describe and preserve organisms and organs. Uh, which is tissue clearing. Um, so the idea is to take a relatively, you know, typically opaque object and make it transparent. So the way this works is that um, in, in microscopy, there's three things that we typically struggle with. One is absorption. There might be pigments that simply allow you not to look into the object. Um, that's something you can bleach. But the other two things are more prominent, which is uh, scattering and refraction. So... Refraction and scattering, you know, they mostly come from the fact that the object is not homogeneous. Uh, of course, it's not. An embryo com is composed of several components and parts and molecules and proteins, and they don't have the same refractive index. So the refractive index across the specimen changes. And the goal in, in, in clearing, tissue clearing, is to homogenize sort of the path for the optics for the for the uh, for the rays in microscopy and so the goal is to replace uh, water and lipids inside the sample with something that is matched in the refractive index to the rest the proteins and only then the sample becomes transparent now it may also destroy your label It may also shrink the sample. There's things that may go wrong in that process, but at least you can, you, you basically have to find a balance because the treatment is very harsh on the specimen to make it transparent, but you still want to be able to label it. And ideally, it should also be um, still, um, you know, it may have shrunk, but it should still be, you know, a, a homogeneous shrinkage and not be completely deformed. Um, there's the other way you can go with, which is expansion microscopy, mm -hmm. where you can make samples bigger. Uh, and it also, you know, we don't have to talk about that, but <laughs> it is something where, where the sample automatically also becomes transparent. Mm -hmm. And now coming back to light sheet microscopy, even though this is a completely different field, you would say it's, it's big samples fixed because they are transparent They are very easy to image now suddenly, but because they are so big, it becomes difficult to image them in their entirety within a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. And that's again where light sheet microscopy is ideal for imaging these. And so the instruments we have in the lab are either tailored for the live imaging or more tailored towards the fixed tissue, clear tissue imaging. Mm -hmm. But the technique, the underlying technique is always light sheet microscopy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's incredible that you... You can do that, and of course, even if your sample shrink or there is some some kind of damage, you, <clears throat> as you said, you would like to have the sample at the end and get as much as possible, mm -hmm. and then um, answer even other questions. Not only during the the recording, that the, the information that you gain, but also some maybe structural changes at the end or functional. Unfortunately, you cannot uh, address. No, but you can. Yeah. But you can merge the information, yeah. right? Yeah. It's yeah. not just. It's not necessarily merging the mm -hmm, images mm -hmm. because that may be difficult, mm -hmm. but it can also be done. Mm -hmm. But it's it's merging the information. And I think people oftentimes uh, have wrong expectations from an instrument, from a microscope, where they think, oh, it's going to deliver me you know, high speed, high resolution, good depth penetration, low phototoxicity and all this. And you simply cannot get everything mm -hmm. with one technique in one instrument. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we have to get better at using multimodal approaches where you're using different modalities uh, for, your, for your research that you say, okay, I have this low resolution but high temporal resolution movie 
where I see something. And then I have that high spatial resolution and no temporal resolution reconstruction, maybe in a cleared sample, but it's the same sample. And it allows me to do some correlation mm -hmm. and uh, extract meaningful information from the different modalities. Right? And ultimately, we want to get to the point that for all the samples we have in the lab or what collaborators bring to the lab, we can say like, you should use this technique and then that technique and then treat it like this and stain it like that and then use this technique or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's incredible that you can actually correlate both board worlds like function and structure and over a huge range of or span of the body of an animal. It's just incredible. You have uh, dropped the term flamingos mm -hmm. and these are these very interesting, nice microscopes. Can you please tell us more about them? Yeah, so um, as I said, we like to build custom microscopes for biological applications. And when I, uh, when I was in Dresden at the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics, uh, at, at the end of my term there, we had built eight light sheet microscopes, all different sizes, different purposes, different, uh, yeah, just different configurations. And... When I then decided to move to the US, it became apparent that there's just no easy way to move these instruments. And it meant a huge break in our science uh, because we, we simply couldn't continue with the instruments that we had built over the years. Um, now, one reason is the, you know, trying the difficulty of moving an instrument from one country to the other. But also people who had built these instruments had left by now, right? So those were, you know, the typical scenario, a postdoc joins the lab or a PhD student. They start with an empty table, optical table. The, they built their project. They built a microscope. And then um, they write their own custom software. And by the time they leave, you know, nobody knows <laughs> besides them how to use the instrument. Mm -hmm. And so I... Me as a group leader, I faced the challenge that I had all these excellent instruments, but I knew that if I, if we were to take them apart, it would be very, very difficult to put them together again because these people would not be available anymore. And so when I arrived in Madison, the idea was born to change this <laughs> and to change it um, you know, uh, for us in the lab, to be more sustainable in how we build microscopes, to have the ability to use... Um, a common framework, a set of standard parts to build, essentially to, to replicate these eight light sheet microscopes in various different ways um, using the same parts and the same software so that we could again build microscope around, microscopes around samples or for different applications, but 95% is always the same in these instruments. And it's just that 5% change that you need to make to, to perfect that instrument for, for a given application. And this is not something that you just do quickly. <laughs> it's something that takes time, and it did take about three years or so. And I was fortunate that in the US, especially in the at the Mortgage Institute for Research, it was... Uh, I was able to recruit engineers. And so I had a, a software engineer who still works for our lab, uh, Joe, and Todd uh, was a prototype engineer, mechanical engineer, um, and Rory Power, a postdoc in the lab who did the optics. And this team and others, uh, they were involved in, in designing an instrument that we would want to use for the coming years, in the next 20 years or whatever, um, and that would be built from these building blocks. And it, it was successful, it works, and uh, this is the, the one and only light sheet microscope that we now use in the lab. So we have a total of um, uh, 15 or so flamingos built by now. Several of these are still in the US, some are here. And... It allows us to very quickly build microscopes and adapt them and change them. So if a postdoc came and said, oh, I have this cool idea how I would want to change something in LightSheet, that person could start with a, a running microscope 
and we could just remove some part and, and, and modify it. They don't have to start from scratch. It also turned out that these microscopes have a very small footprint, so they were actually portable. Now, this wasn't our original intention, as I described. It was more about being more sustainable in our development. Um, but what it allows us now to do is to move these instruments within the lab, which already it may sound trivial, but it's actually quite beneficial if you can put a microscope into your fish room or under the hood or in a dark room or in a seminar room, or you can take it to a lecture and you can use it for teaching. The other benefit was then that we could suddenly use these instruments for collaborations in a more, much more efficient way. Because again, as I described earlier, when somebody develops a fancy microscope, there's only that one, and it's usually tied to a table into a room and can never ever leave that room. So if you wanted to use that fancy microscope, you would have to travel to that lab, bring your samples, which may be living organisms, living cells, and who knows what happens to them if they are jet lagged <laughs> as you're going <laughs> to a different country, uh, or they simply may not survive the trip. And so it's a lot easier uh, shipping a microscope than shipping a living biological sample. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the second benefit of the flamingo was then that we can actively use these instruments to share them with other collaborators or essentially the entire world if we wanted to um, and make them accessible to all scientists, no matter if they have the funds to buy such an instrument, they could just borrow it. Um, and that just opens up a, a lot of new possibilities for open science and open access. In, in terms of pricing, let's put that in, in perspective. For mm -hmm. example, Confoco or even the super resolution microscopes, they can go up to 1.52 million euros yes. per instrument. Yeah. Yeah. And how is the price, like what is the price range of such a microscope, for example? I mean, it's always hard to compare because, yeah. of course, yes. you know, the commercial yes. system, you're also yes. paying for the labor. Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. I give you a price for the Flamingo, that would be without labor and mm -hmm. the hard work of mm -hmm. many scientists in mm -hmm. my lab. And uh, But if you just look at the bare price of the components, it's typically between 50,000 euros and mm -hmm. 100,000 euros. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Of course, it, it, it offers the possibility also in terms of funding mm -hmm. that, you know, a funding agency like the DFG decides not to give 1 million or 2 million euros to a single lab from which they could buy one of these commercial instruments, but give it to, a, to the research community in a way that they may give it to a lab like mine that can build several such instruments from such a generous uh, fund and then distribute these in Germany, right? So you, you could pay for a postdoc and, and let's say five flamingos and, uh, and that postdoc could travel around Germany and distribute five flamingos. And if they stayed in each lab for only two months, which sometimes is enough mm -hmm. for people to do an experiment, right? Then each flamingo would visit six labs. So you would reach 30 labs in one year with the same amount of money that would otherwise just be put into one lab, mm -hmm. right? And of course, don't forget the the teaching component, right? It could it could educate physics students how to build how these instruments are built, educate computer scientists how these are run and programmed, and of course the biologists who then get to use these instruments in their lab, so they don't even have to leave the lab and go to a facility which may already be too far for your living samples. You can do your experiment in your lab. And, and not only this accessibility teaching aspect, but also you work towards better reproducibility of your yes, experiment, yeah. which is one of the big problems in, in life science now. And I love that. I love that. And really, personally, I don't use this microscope, but I have some ideas in mind. Maybe at some point I will contact sure, you. Yeah. And <laughs> who knows? Um, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Yes. So of course, yeah, I mean, the idea then is if as people publish, um, you know, their work, they could say this was done with a flamingo. Mm -hmm. And essentially anybody in the world could say like, I have a cool idea how to follow up on that mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. Um, can you please send me the same instrument mm -hmm. or, you know, 
uh, one that in in the same configuration, and I could send one to South America or to China or to wherever, and um, and suddenly <clears throat> enable those people to reproduce these results or continue along those lines. As I said earlier, um, most discoveries are not the work of a single lab. It's several labs that want to collaborate. And having the same instrument and the same data format means that it much it is much the, the data is much more compatible, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's a little bit like, you know, you could you could also take one flamingo and travel around the world, for example, if you wanted to compare different species. Mm -hmm. Some species may can only be found in some parts of the world, and um, you could take your microscope with you, right? Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. that means that you're not bound to whatever is available in that respective location. But it's a little bit like, <clears throat> you know, the the early scientists that traveled with a little uh, pocket travel <laughs> microscope. Now you can do the same. You can travel around the world with your own microscope. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they can be remotely controlled um, is another benefit that allows us, when these instruments are placed in a lab, where they have, may have little microscopy expertise, that we or other people can assist them remotely in running their experiments. So mm -hmm. it can be, you know, a multi-lab collaboration with the only requirement that the microscope is where the sample is, but the person who runs the instrument or the person who runs the analysis could be in a whole different lab or in a different country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know, there is no drawback so far. Of course, there is some, <laughs> but to me personally, when I hear all of this, it's just so incredible and, I don't know, make science just make science accessible for, for, for people around the world, for samples, for collaborations, for discoveries. It's, it's just incredible. But... Now, we, maybe before we go to the smart microscopy part and remote um, controlling of your microscopes, let's uh, discuss briefly when you image a whole organism for several days, what is the amount of data that you acquire, mm. right? Yeah, interestingly, when, when you, sometimes when you hear about light sheet microscopy, there's two disadvantages that people cite. One is... Sample preparation is difficult, and that's not true. Uh, sometimes it's difficult, but the thing is, it's um, it's different. And uh, and as I said, it allows you to image something suddenly in total or in 3D, and it's not on a cover slip anymore, which we anyway don't have in our bodies, right? So uh, we're looking at something. We have to embed it for Lychee typically to be in a 3D gel or in a 3D matrix, <clears throat> which actually uh, replicates some of the features that cells typically have in a, in a living animal or in our body. So the other thing that people sometimes cite as a disadvantage is the large amounts of data. Now, first of all, you could run a light sheet microscope at the same slow speed as a confocal, and it would still be better <laughs> because of the lower phototoxicity. Um, uh, you can still run a much longer experiment than you could do on a confocal. The danger, though, is that because it's so fast, people are tempted to run it at maximum speed, right? So you say, I'm doing a two-day-long experiment. I want to image my sample from four sides or eight sides. I want to illuminate from two directions. And I want to image it every five seconds. And ideally, I would want to have five samples lined up and image them simultaneously, right? Maybe not at five seconds you could do that, but 10, 20 seconds or so. <clears throat> so the machine would be running continuously, and it produces about a gigabyte per second. Um, so easily you have several tens of terabytes of data. right? And that's, again, where you have to really teach people how to use these instruments because it's like a, it's like a race car that <laughs> may, may sound like fun, but uh, if you don't know how to drive it, you know, it could easily end up as a, mm -hmm. in an accident. And so the same with light sheet. I think um, um, we oftentimes even experience scientists, we have to teach them how to approach an experiment and not just jump in and just 
put all sliders to the max and just go all in, but rather first figure out how often do you really have to image your sample, mm -hmm. right? What's a good temporal sampling that you need to uh, achieve? Um, what exactly are you trying to see anyways, right? <laughs> uh, do you need a multi-view reconstruction or would maybe one or the other angle be sufficient? Um, how many samples eventually do you need to image, etc.? Because once you've reached 10 terabytes or even one terabyte of data, it becomes a burden for people to, to move the data and to analyze the mm -hmm. data. Mm -hmm. And the danger is always that people acquire all this data one day and then they put it somewhere and they say, oh, I have another slot on Wednesday. I'll take more data. And then they take more and more data without actually having analyzed the previous experiment. Mm -hmm. And that's something I tell the students all the time. <laughs> you know, you have to first analyze, you have to have certain expectations. Then you analyze your data, see if you've met those expectations, if you can extract the information, and then think about the next experiment and design your next experiment. And as soon as you have these terabytes of data, it becomes, it becomes a, a, a difficult thought process and you have to allocate enough time for moving data, analyzing the data. And it's not just about blaming your slow computer or your small hard drive and just hoping you can solve it with money, buying bigger hard drives mm -hmm. or a faster computer, you still have to think very hard about how exactly you run your experiment to avoid being drowned mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. the data. There's no point in overcomplicating it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, but it, it's very easy in mm -hmm. Lightsheet, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you just set it, press a button, and it runs. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> then you find out that you're actually incapable of ever looking at the data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It happens it's all the time. huge if you want to image every five seconds over days. Oh, my God. Who is going to analyze this? I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of data analysis. So first, I wanted to ask you something um, regarding the smart microscopy, right? I attended one of your talks during the Excellence Cluster Retreat, I believe last year, I don't remember, in, in Austria. Mm -hmm. um, and you introduced this, this kind of idea that um, eventually, now or in the near future, we would have microscopes that are able to recognize some pattern in your sample and then send this to another microscope that can actually start looking about this pattern, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is incredible. And here there is this artificial intelligence perhaps playing role. Can you please elaborate on this in this regard? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it is something, <clears throat> yet another idea that comes out of the light sheet microscopy because it's so fast again. And you know, maybe to put it into perspective on a on a regular, let's say, confocal microscope, uh, typically the process is, you know, you've you've prepared your sample, you put it into the microscope, you look with your eyepiece, you find it, um, you know, and then you sit down in the front of the computer and you make some adjustments and um and that takes some time. And especially um when when you're committing when you start, when you press the start button, you have to be absolutely sure you, that you've done everything correctly because you know that the next half hour or the next few hours or whatever, the experiment will be running and there's no way for you to interfere with it. On the light sheet microscope, this is very different. The moment you put the sample into the microscope, the microscope could automatically already start analyzing the sample. So basically, by the time you actually sit down on your chair, <laughs> the microscope could have already analyzed the sample. It could have, for example, recognized how transparent the sample is, how many angles would need to be acquired, which angles happen to be the best, because it's not always 0, 90, 180, mm -hmm. but it could be some odd numbers. Um, and it could have identified maybe even, oh, it's a zebrafish. Oh, it's... 24 hours old. Oh, we looked at that yesterday. I've already learned something yesterday from that experiment. Well, now maybe we should focus more on the things that I didn't quite understand yesterday. Let's zoom in to the brain because yesterday we tried to image the whole fish and I didn't really have time to focus onto the brain. So that ultimately is what I mean by smart microscopy, that a lot of these choices are made automatically by the microscope. Um, 
based on the sample as you present it into the microscope and you're not you don't even have to move any sliders and find and rotate the sample it's done automatically but ultimately the goal should be that sort of as i as i said uh, as i had just said that you want to learn from one experiment to the other right and that that process is you assisted in that process by the computer by the microscope mm -hmm. so to say right that it says I've understood this part. I don't even have to look into that region because I've seen 137 zebrafish develop. I don't need to see this. This fish looks exactly the same as all previous fish I've seen. But here, over here, there's, there's something peculiar that I haven't seen before. Right? Can, can we zoom into this part? And the microscope would automatically <coughs> record data that that is something that you haven't seen before, right? And um, for us, sometimes it's very difficult to to find these phenotypes, right? Mm -hmm. The way it's typically done is that you have a Petri dish with 200 embryos and you look at them under a stereo microscope and trying to, to screen for a mutation to then, you know, maybe find a new gene that you weren't, you know, that, that wasn't known to be involved in a certain process. And uh, even under the microscope, it becomes, or in a light sheet microscope, it, it just becomes overwhelming uh, because you are so distracted by all the things that you already know and you don't really see the needle in the haystack. And in order to find that, you need some assistance. And AI, you know, uh, in computational intelligence can, can help you find that. And, and light sheet can produce tons of data, which is great for AI. <laughs> Um, and so ultimately, yeah, we, we would want to get to the point where we have a, a set of flamingos, a flamingo farm, a flock of flamingos, <laughs> I should say, <laughs> right? Uh, 10 flamingos side by side in the lab and they just run nonstop, um, which again, you wouldn't do if each instrument was a million euros, you wouldn't have 10 of them. <laughs> no way. Whereas, you know, if it's affordable, small footprint, you can easily have 10 side by side in a lab. And all you have to do is put the samples in or that something a robot could do. Mm -hmm. um, and they could run nonstop and produce the data. And they could talk to each other, right? It could be one flamingo saying, oh, seeing this in this fish over there, do you see the same, <laughs> right? And the other flamingo can look at that fish and say like, no, no, I mean, this fish, no, I, it looks different. Mm -hmm. And so they can have a conversation and could maybe say like, remove this sample, give me a new one. This one is boring, right? Or this one is wild type or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> wow. And you eliminate immediately the bias of the observer, right? So, I mean, yeah. you by <coughs> programming, maybe you introduce some bias uh, when the microscope has to decide or, or the AI, yeah. but you kind of eliminate the human bias, which is very, very good for, for reproducibility again, right? Yeah, yeah. What if you have 10 flamingos doing these experiments nonstop? How would you analyze this data? What is the Well, ideally, you only produce data you're actually interested in, mm -hmm. right? So with the idea that, you know, uh, the, the first sample, you still image completely, <clears throat> right? You, you try to image it in total every five seconds, whatever. Um, and then you have a certain set of knowledge. And then the second time you look at a fish of a similar age, you would say, yeah, okay, I've seen this before. So you would be very selective in what you're actually imaging. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with the idea that <clears throat> your your information content, looking at the entire data set that you accumulate, your information content gets higher and higher. You, mm -hmm. you gather more and more information, um, I guess, to some point where simply there is not much more information to be extracted. So it's going to saturate at some point. Um, but you're also acquiring fewer and fewer pieces of data because you've already seen so much. There's very little that you need to see. With the idea <clears throat> that eventually you get an understanding of how how one <clears throat> one individuum differs from another, right? Mm -hmm. That you can say, all right, this is within the limits, this is within the variance that I've observed previously, mm -hmm. right? So you can imagine it's similar to like, you know, face recognition or so, you, you see some face and say like, okay, yeah, two eyes, two ears, a nose and so on. 
but then you see the next face and you say like okay check same things but oh wait this this guy has longer hair or this girl has glasses and so you're learning more and more but at some point you get to the point where you've seen it all <laughs> so mm -hmm, to speak mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. and you've understood what you know what the wild type looks like and and that's something that we even haven't really fully understood and so even before we look into mutations phenotypes we first need to understand what the wild type looks like and the reason why we haven't really fully understood that is that we haven't had the amount of data we needed and the number of samples that we needed to to fully understand the variants that we see in development mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. and there's a lot of dead ends that people have run into i'd say which is like um trying to perfect image processing to the extent to for example segment all nuclei and track every single nucleus in a developing embryo that can be very misleading because once you've perfected that you don't even know what to do with all the tracks because the next embryo is going to look differently mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so ideally you would you don't want to always a take the same amount of data for every single sample but you only look at the differences and focus on those mm -hmm. and this immediately will give time the, the save time to the observer to scan everything that is <clears throat> not useful just you concentrate on the content that actually makes sense right yeah and it and saves samples mm -hmm. right living yeah. organisms exactly, we're we exactly. doing fewer animal experiments because We can be more selective and say, like, yeah, I only need to see a certain developmental phase. I don't need to take the whole movie over and over again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's incredible. I, I just, while we are talking, I'm thinking about, okay, how can I use this method for my purposes? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I will find out soon. Um, yeah, I'm studying some, the extracellular matrix, and the problem there is that there are, almost no tools to label with genetically because mm. of the the, 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 the the nature of these molecules and then we need to use external dyes which might not be that useful for for this kind of microscopy but we're working in, in, in this in this direction okay so we talked quite a lot about exciting science and um, it's always motivating inspiring to hear this um, however in, in our field, um, now it's interesting to hear your, your opinion. And in the field of science, especially life science, there are some problems and we face them every day, like the reproducibility or people living in academia, difficulties uh, getting grants, the publishing industry is also very bizarre, and many, many more. Right? These are maybe most uh, the most prominent, let's put it that way. I would like to ask you for your opinion on this this these problems as as a physicist who has solid experience in life science what would be something that you would like to change or improve somehow yeah i mean uh, I, despite all the <laughs> disadvantages i think one should also advertise you know why science can be so exciting um and For me, it's really a huge playground, um, you know, the ability to to move between different fields and, and play play around with different technologies and techniques and and develop new stuff and 3D print things and try them in the microscope and, you know, work with colorful living organisms and uh, produce pretty pictures and movies. It's it's simply fantastic. But I completely agree. Um, there's a lot of uh, challenges, and we already talked about traveling and moving every five years to a new place, which which can be disastrous for you know your career, for your family, for all sorts of things. Um, so all these things are very challenging. Um, funding wise, I mean, we briefly touched upon it. I think there should be more effort on distributing the money more equally. Um, also to you know places that may not be so well funded there is always the tendency to give people who already have a lot of money even more money mm -hmm. um, and hopefully technologies like the flamingo help to distribute um, technology better hopefully with the with the money um, publishing 
Fortunately, now we have uh, things like you know archive, bioarchive that allow us to to simply put hypotheses, manuscripts out there. I wish that the journals would maybe take this in, as an incentive to to maybe then fight for these manuscripts because right now it's still this two two things, right? So on the one hand, you submit it to bioarchive, and on the other hand. You still have to publish it in a proper journal, ideally with a high impact factor, mm-hmm. because that's how you are rated oftentimes. Um, and then you start your journey. You start in a high impact journal, send it there. It gets rejected. Send it to the next one. Time goes by. Your PhD ends, and your paper still isn't uh, published. So my suggestion would be something like you put it on bioarchive, and the journals have to bet on it in some ways right they have to fight for your manuscript like if nature says well this sounds like a cool story would you consider like could we get a first bet on it and uh, and uh, and review it or so rather than going going both ways or oftentimes people only go one way and don't submit it to bio archive mm-hmm. so yeah and, and i i think one thing that you simply cannot eliminate with the publishing the way it is, is is really your chances and your luck and, you know, luck finding the right, getting the right reviewer that's ideally a friend of yours, you know, who really likes your work and uh, doesn't cause any problems and asks you for more weird experiments to do. But that wouldn't be fair. But that's what happens, right? And sometimes, you know, you re- review papers where, or review manuscripts where you've just seen a great talk and you're already biased, right? It's not a collaborator, it's not a friend of yours, but you just saw that person speak at a conference and you say, oh, fantastic, right? Then there's Twitter or, you know, other, uh, uh, you know, other channels where people shout very loudly about certain techniques and that puts some bias into into editors mm-hmm. and journals and something we would we, we should certainly avoid. Um, so between Twitter and or X and uh, you know a, a proper journal, peer review journal, there's a lot that we can still explore. And honestly, I haven't really found a good way. But I think with with open access and uh, preprint archives, we are in, uh, in a good way on a good path. Mm-hmm. But certainly not there where we should be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There is still a lot to be done. And for me as a young scientist, uh, I also, this is one of the aspects that makes me think, okay, do I want to really struggle with with this uh, publishing a paper that takes more than a year sometimes? And then Mm -hmm. you are under stress because of the outcome of this publishing um, your c- future career relies on right absolutely uh, if you're getting yeah. grant or not and it's like a very strange vicious circle um, that it is it is yeah uh, but I mean honestly everything you know I, I described a little bit my my career and a lot of these things are just pure luck <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> right yeah. I mean I was lucky that you know the light sheet microscope my PhD work was published in science. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I probably wouldn't be here if that hadn't worked out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and uh, and also then all other career steps. Oftentimes it's like you know you meet someone at a conference, you have dinner with someone, and then you hear like oh there's an open position or you know that that that's how everything uh, some somehow works mm-hmm. and. Uh, but I, I I would say it's probably not not much different in 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 the industry. Um, there's <laughs> there's a lot of things that we should tell the students what's not so great in industry that mm-hmm. they don't get the picture that everything is fine. You just go to Google and you can spend the rest of your life at Google. That's not going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of good things in science, and uh, but yeah, there's still this pyramid that. Obviously, there's not a professorship for every student. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, people will leave academia along the way. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I don't I don't want to be anywhere else. I enjoy what I'm doing. And uh, maybe I've just been lucky in some instances. But I enjoy, you know, using my instinct to find 
great scientific projects and uh, doing what we do and and work with all levels of uh, of uh, scientists, students, all the way to postdocs and. Uh, Sometimes it's hard working, you know, dealing with that turnover. You have great people in the lab and I've always had very good people in the lab and it's always a pain when they when they leave the lab and but then new people come and they turn out also to be great and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that's part of it. It's a fascinating journey. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I, we are not really very well prepared for it, right? As you said earlier, you know, I'm a physicist, but I'm also a manager. I'm a conductor, as I said. So I'm, I have all the strings in my hands and I have to somehow understand a little bit of everything and make the right decisions mm -hmm. along mm -hmm. the way. And, and it's, it's, it's not something I was necessarily trained for. You're, you're learning on the job. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's lifelong learning, yes, which I yes. like the most. Yeah. Um, I think it's an incredible positive notion to, to end our conversation. Professor Husken, thank you once again for, for your time. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. And I hope that we meet soon during our retreat or maybe collaborate in the future. I don't know. Thank you very yes. much was my pleasure i think you had the exact right questions to so i could i could tell people what's really close to my heart and where i see you know our microscopy or you know the science around it uh, where it's moving and what's important to us and maybe it's been inspiring for other people out there to see that there are really cool things we can do at this interface of physics and biology and computer science and so yeah thank you so much for having me It's a great pleasure. I'm sure it's going to be very inspiring. Neuroscience and beyond. No more. Get inspired.